Good afternoon, good evening, good morning from wherever you're joining us from today. My name's Sarah and I'm the Program and Event Manager at The Reactor in Sydney, Australia. Welcome to another Microsoft Reactor Sydney live stream event and uh, part of our Devs Down Under series. I'd like to welcome Aaron Powell. Aaron is, hi Aaron. Aaron is a developer advocate at Microsoft, having spent 15 years doing web development. Uh, he's seen it all, apparently, from browsing wars, the rise of Ajax, and the fall of 20 JavaScript frameworks. In this session, Aaron will take a look through your toolbox and how you can make the most of it. Uh, so this session will be 60 minutes with about 10 minutes for questions at the end, but do make comments throughout and between Aaron and myself, we'll try and answer as many as possible in the Q&A section. Uh, there will also be a live on-demand version um, of this session available immediately after on our YouTube channel, which will also share the link with you and our feedback survey as well. We'll put a link to that in the Q&A towards the end. You'll see I've already shared with you our check-in link. Please uh, check in for today's session using the event code provided in the chat box as well. Um, that'll be able to provide you with additional resources from today's session um, and just some extra stuff. But without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to Aaron to begin. So Aaron, over to you. Hey, Sarah, and welcome to everyone that's watching live. And for those of you that are uh, watching the recording, hello from the past. Uh, my name is Aaron Powell. And uh, yeah, as, uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm, uh, I work at Microsoft as part of the Developer Advocates team. Uh, but I've been doing web development for, well, I say 15 years, but that's because it's easier to say 15 years than probably admit how long it's actually been. Um, I started uh, when the web was a very different uh, platform to what we were using today. We were using a lot of different styles of technology. And I've, so I've seen a lot of evolution in the way that we do web development. And I wanted to talk a bit about some of the stuff that I think has happened uh, from a Microsoft standpoint over the last couple of years that not everyone may have caught all of the things that we've done to make it a little bit easier if you're doing particularly front-end web development. So when I started, um, I was doing a lot of .NET and uh, stuff like that on the server, but spent and then probably the, the latter half of uh, my recent career, so probably about the last 10 years, uh, pretty heavily doing front-end web development. But let's talk a bit about where we came from and, 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 and how the way that we kind of evolved the sort of applications that we were building. So this is me uh, as I was back in my younger days building web applications, uh, as we all did, you know, hanging out in, in coffee shops and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, so this photo was taken in around about, I think about 2011. I was actually over at Microsoft uh, for MVP Summit and uh, we were just uh, hacking away on a, a, uh, some projects after the event and uh, yeah, I was probably wearing sunglasses because I might've feeling, been feeling a little under the weather uh, after that. But, uh, when, when I started professionally uh, developing websites, it was around about 2005. Um, I'd graduated uni and the sort of stuff I'd been doing in uni was very low level systems programming. I'd done a lot of stuff with Unix and Linux machines and like, mainframes and like, my primary programming languages at that point in time were things like C. So the web was somewhat a foreign experience to me. But, the, and also the state of the web back then was very different to uh, where it is now in 2021. Uh, we had modern web browsers like Netscape Communicator and Internet Explorer 5 and 6. Um, we, like Internet Explorer was still a, available for Mac. I, I remember working with IE5 on Mac. Um, and, but at, at that point in time, we, we still were also targeting older browsers. Uh, we had things like IE3, 4 as well. And IE6 was the new shiny browser was, that was getting a lot of traction. It was really an exciting browser to develop for because of the way that it worked compared to a lot of the other browsers at the time. I, um, targeting really early versions of Netscape Navigator, not even Netscape Communicator, its predecessor, Netscape Navigator, where you might not have even had JavaScript available in it. And there were, uh, we would have to consider how we were building applications for those kinds of um, uh, those kinds of users. That they, they, the JavaScript, it wasn't that they turned it off, it just simply wasn't a thing for them. Uh, 
Editors were a lot more simplistic. Um, Notepad++ was one of the first Windows-based editors uh, that I used. I said I came from sort of a Unix, Linux background, so I was used to Emacs and Jed and Pico and stuff like that. Uh, but then Notepad++ Notepad++ was phenomenally more powerful. I, I, I could have like, syntax highlighting and I got autocomplete and you know, we, we had like side by side and multiple tabs and we could have multiple files open that we could easily switch between them. And, and, I, and that was, it was really revolutionary in the way that we built web applications. Look, sure, I, I also did web applications where we're using like Dreamweaver and Front Page and you know, uh, Notepad and, and even yeah, Pico and um, VI and stuff like that. Like we, we built applications like that. But these sort of like next generation web uh, like, uh, text editors that we were getting with Notepad++ really made it a lot easier to build applications. Uh, but once you you kind of you build your application, you needed to test it, and particularly doing cross-browser testing. Well, I don't know if anyone else remembers using a tool such as IE Tester, but like I said, we like we we had multiple versions of browsers that you needed to test against, but you couldn't have them installed side by side. You you had the version of IE that was on that machine. You couldn't go back and test the other ones. Like if if we were building an application and we, we were on an XP machine and we needed to be able to test like IE five or IE four, we we needed some way to do that. And IE test was actually a way that we did that. Um, this was a revolutionary tool in our toolbox because what it did is it 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 ran multiple versions of IE's rendering engine, so you could run them side by side as um, as different tabs and kind of compare where things were at. Um, IE wasn't even a tabbed based browsering experience; like tag browsers were not a thing back right, when I started doing web development. Um, and I, I, the fact that this tool allowed us to have tabs was kind of like it was really exciting to because you, you didn't have multiple windows; you actually had tabs. Uh, and this is this is IE Tester running multiple versions of IE doing the ACID test, uh, which was a CSS test to kind of compare how different rendering engines were supporting um, the uh, different aspects of CSS. Um, and what a lot of people don't realize is that we, we kind of look back at this time and look at you know, browsers like IE6 and the fact that it took you know, so long to, to disappear from the market and think about that as it was this archaic browser. But at the time, IE6 was really, really revolutionary. It it actually was implementing CSS standards where up until that point, most browsers hadn't. So while it while in you know, sort of 2015, when we were really seeing it starting to like finally tail out, it was it, it, had, it had been a really powerful browser when it was first released and people kind of forgot about that sort of stuff. So you know, while we, we can look at you know, some really broken CSS here, um, it was the reason that it was like that at the, at the time. And, um, but we, we were still trying to build an, an application that would support across these multiple environments. But it wasn't just how do like, the things look that we were trying to debug. We tried to debug JavaScript. Uh, a, a, when I first was um, doing web development, JavaScript applications were nowhere near as complex as they are today. Like, we were not building something like we, we weren't using something like React or Angular or like anything to anywhere close to that level of, of power. You would just have a sprinkling of JavaScript here, and it was doing things like rollover menus as you are, uh, uh, so you could change the the background image that was on a like a, a navigation system that you had on your website. But when things didn't work, this was like this is debugging. Um, you would get an error and it would just go, there's an error on line four and you're like, great, forgot a parenthesis. So you go back and put that there and there, but you've got this dialogue you've got to dismiss. Nowadays, you kind of just have these errors that silently log out to the console and like your page doesn't work and you don't realize it doesn't work because there's a JavaScript error. Um, this was very in your face that it was an error and you, but you couldn't really do a whole lot with it. Um, there weren't really JavaScript debuggers built into browsers either. Now we we end up using tools like Visual Studio, and you launch out to Visual Studio, connect to the IE process, and that's how you would debug your JavaScript. It wasn't until something like Firebug started coming along and bringing that into the browser. Firebug was uh, the original browser developer tools for Firefox. Uh, it was an extension that you would install and it'd allow you to inspect the DOM, manipulate CSS, um, and then get into like debugging scenarios and things like that with JavaScript. And that was that made us realize that this approach to you know, just this um, 
pop-up that then you launched out to a separate tool wasn't the most efficient way to do um, debugging. And we didn't even have, like, you didn't have the console either that you could log out to. So if you had, like, if you wanted to dump out the response of an, an Ajax call, uh, you kind of just converted that to a string and used an alert, which was really difficult when you had large payloads coming back from servers. And deployment. Uh, like you, if you were lucky enough to work at a company where you actually had servers on premise that you were deploying to, at, at least you weren't just copying it straight off your machine into production. Uh, but you were still probably using something like an FTP where you would upload the files to the server that you were trying to deploy to. Uh, and invariably, we'd end up with a, a folder in the IS root directory, or like a series of folders, and they were just like, they were the rollback points. Because you just create a new folder and you'd upload the new version, then you would configure IS to point to the new site, and then you end up with just dot back, dot back, dot back, dot back. And hopefully, you would have uh, all of them um, <laughs> successful at the at the right point in time, and you didn't accidentally um, upload an old version because you were just copying it off another uh, machine somewhere. Um, it was definitely points in time where it was uh, it was an FTP off a developer's machine to get into production. But it was it was a simpler style of web application we were building. We weren't building these complex single page applications. We weren't using major JavaScript frameworks to do things like the, the most advanced framework that we were using were things like Mootools or jQuery or YUI. Um, we didn't have these complex application stacks. And we were kind of happy with what we, we had. Like the, the tools, they worked, they were cumbersome, but compared to you know, like server-side debugging, they weren't really any different. But as we know, the web's grown up. Since then, uh, people have wanted us to build more and more complex web applications. And by building more and more complex web applications, we need to really think more about how we use the tools that we have available to us. And are those tools adequate enough for what we want? I, doing alert-based debugging today, when I want to like see the response of a fetch request, it, like that's not an efficient way to do it. We want to be able to inspect the object, expand and collapse it, or um, uh, have a way that you can actually copy the res um, the response back and and like pop it into another tool where you can uh, have a look at that in more detail and things like that. We want more CSS to whether it's bringing in animations or um, uh, it's like splitting CSS files up over multiple uh, CSS up over multiple files instead of just one monolithic file. Uh, that we need we need better tools, and that's. That's what I want to talk about today is what are the better tools that we've got that have kind of uh, you know, emerged over the, the time that I've been doing web development, but more specifically over the last couple of years, as I said, some of these people may be already familiar with, um, but hopefully there's a couple in here that you haven't either had a chance to play with or haven't heard of before. And that's the kind of stuff that might really change the way that you think about how you're doing development at the moment. So the first tool, and it's kind of going to be the cornerstone of a lot of what I talk about today, is VS Code. A good chance that most people are using VS Code um, in some way, shape, or form already. Uh, it's a, it's by and far uh, like the most popular editor that I've seen in the market for a very long time, and and I'm a huge fan of VS Code. But for those of you who haven't had a, like spent much time with VS Code or haven't really played around with it, let's just kind of break down what it is. So, um, one thing that I really like about VS Code is the customization aspect of it. So like all applications on pretty much every OS, we end up with a title bar across the top, which we've got our menu system, you know, file, view, selection, etc. Uh, and then we've got context information around what we're doing. Like we're in a file called index.html, in a project, um, and, and so on and so forth. But this is all customizable. So we can modify that. Like, do we need to know that, um, like, the, the root folder is React foldable in this case, or we can customize that out through the settings inside of VS Code. Um, uh, VS Code has uh, a way that we can navigate through files through the, the sidebar. Uh, it also has ability to get to extensions and other things that are available in the sidebar. Um, uh, this is actually a slightly old screenshot of the way that I have my VS Code set up. Uh, we'll see that a little bit later. Um, but I tend to dock the sidebar on the right-hand side, not the left-hand side anymore. And um, the main reason for that is that um, if you expand and collapse it, so Control B uh, will hide and show, or Command B if you're not on a Windows machine, uh, will hide and show um, the the sidebar. But then what it'll do is it'll shift the 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 
the code space or the, the, the text area to fill up the, the remaining space. So if you've got it on the left and you collapse it, then your text moves further left. If you put it on the right and then you hide and show it, then it doesn't change the left alignment of your content. So I, it's just a little trick that I learned uh, from a colleague of mine, uh, and I find that's actually really useful when uh, when working in VS Code because I like to you know, sort of maximize things out so I have uh, optimal code uh, code working area, um, and because I do left to right uh, languages, that it's having it on the right hand side just means that I have left uh, moving around of pieces. Again, more customization across the, the bottom of VS Code. Here I've got a lot of information that's being presented. I've got that I'm on a re remote connection. I've got the Git branch name. I've got indication of whether I've got errors or warnings um, inside of the uh, the files that I've got open. Um, I've got a bunch of other stuff there. We can turn as much of that off as we want, again, through um, through settings, just to, to optimize the editor for what information we need at that point in time. So if I don't need to know this is a HTML file because I can look at the text and say, oh, yep, that's HTML, um, I, can, you know, I can remove that from this um, a status bar across the bottom and line endings, etc. I can I can collapse all of those down so I don't have that, and I, I can remove maybe some cognitive overload that I've got by looking at something that could be perceived as very busy uh, for um, some people. Uh, VS Code comes with a built-in terminal. Uh, this can run as many terminal sessions as you want, running whether it's uh, a, like Bash or like ZSH, um, debugging terminals for JavaScript. I uh, run interactive consoles for Node or C Sharp or um, F Sharp or anything like that. Uh, this can all run with inside of the context of your editor. And now the, the value of this is by bringing it into your editor, you don't have these multiple locations where you've got to navigate uh, through. Like you don't swap back and forth between multiple applications to see the things that you're doing. And from a web development standpoint, a lot of the tools that we tend to use are command line first. You know, whether it's like Node and NPM because we're running a server or installing packages to auxiliary tools that we can use to um, do uh, like CSS post-processing and stuff like that will often be command line first. Um, uh, so having uh, having quick access to the terminal I find is really useful. Uh, naturally, VS Code actually has a place where we can edit files. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of things that I've talked about about VS Code that aren't about editing text because, well, to be honest, the, the fact that you can edit a text in VS Code is kind of a given. You'd expect it to be able to do that, but it's also not that interesting, I think, in, compared to everything else that VS Code can do. And then finally, um, we get a, a, a minimap view of the files that you've got open, which means that you get this kind of 10,000 foot view of the file and uh, you can quickly navigate around it. And if you've got errors and warnings and stuff like that, they'll appear there so you can jump up and down and uh, quickly navigate, um, particularly if you're working with large files. But one thing about VS Code that I think makes it a really powerful tool for uh, anyone to make it their own is the extensibility of it. Everyone is going to have opinions on what is the right extensions that you're going to need to install for the kind of development you're doing. You know, whether it's web development, server side development, um, data science, etc. Like everyone's going to have their pick of extensions. So I'm not going to stand here and you know, tell everyone exactly the extensions they need to install. Uh, but I want to highlight two extensions that, as a front end web developer, I think a lot of people aren't aware exist, and I find them super powerful. The first is the Microsoft Edge tools for VS Code. So what this does is it allows you to run the, uh, the the Edge developer tools inside of VS Code. So what it does is it connects to the uh, to your uh, the Edge browser that's running, and then gives you the Element Inspector. So you can you know, navigate through the HTML um, or navigate through the DOM structure. Uh, you can um, manipulate the attributes of DOM elements. You can manipulate styles, etc. Um, you can also then have the network uh, access to the network tab, so you can you know, watch the the network graph and um, see the like what files have been requested. If you've got an, like an AJAX request that's failed or a fetch request that's failed, um, you can see that and you can look at the response that's come there entirely with inside of your um, uh, your text editor. And I, the reason I think that's useful is what. Uh, we can do that already. Like it works just fine inside of um, like inside of Edge. Like you've got those tools available to you. But now we've brought them closer to where the code lives. So if you're working on something with like, whether it's um, a CSS file um, uh, or a JavaScript file, and you want to be able to like quickly navigate to the line where that's changed. 
So you want to navigate to a line where a particular bit of CSS exists. Um, you can click on that in the um, in the uh, the element inspector, and that'll take you through to that file on disk rather than to the file that's been served out. Even if you've got source maps, um, so you're using a post processor, so where it's like SAS to CSS or um, something like that, you, you can go back to the original file if, uh, by following the source map. So now you're no longer having to you know, jump between a couple of different um, places to access you know, uh, the, the file and, and to do uh, work with them. You've got more of the, the development experience back in a development tool, and the browser is then responsible for just doing what browsers do serving out pages. Um, another one is the JavaScript de debugger for Microsoft Edge. So this uh, uses the uh, remote debugging protocol uh, that the browsers have. So um, this one, uh, I'm talking about the Edge version, but there's also a Chrome version and a Firefox version. I think that there is a Safari version. Um, I don't have a Mac, so I don't do really any testing of Safari. Uh, but what it does is it, it uses the VS Code debugging experience and connects that to the browser. So again, you're doing using the developer tools that you've got, so the like the actual text editor, and you are doing all the things that you would do, you know, from the browser anyway. But you're doing it at the source files. Um, and again, if you're using source maps and stuff like that, if you're if you're doing a React application in TypeScript and you're compiling um, TypeScript React code down to JavaScript, you debug that original code on that original file uh, from that original file on disk, which you know, uh, for me, it reduces cognitive load. I don't have to, I'm in one set of tools because that's where I can debug. But then if I need to make a change, I need to go elsewhere, go to that file, find that line, make that update, and then um, cycle back around. Well, let's put uh, debugging tooling aside and let's talk a bit about collaboration. I mean, if there's anything that 2020 taught us is the value of being able to collaborate in a remote environment. Um, whether that's you're reviewing a pull request that a peer has put up and you can no longer just walk over to their desk and get them to uh, and ask them some questions to you're trying to work through a problem on your own and you need to uh, get a colleague to give you a hand. They can't come and sit next to you and you can't pair program on just like a single computer anymore because we can't be in the same physical space anywhere near as easily as we previously could be. And no doubt that everyone's been on the, the tail end of whether it's like a Teams call or a Zoom or whatever it might be where you're like, you, you, you just kind of want to reach through the screen and be like, no, can you just click that, that file? And no matter the, whatever instructions you're giving to the person over the call, they're just not quite following what you're wanting them to do. And you just, it's like, okay, I, I can't, I can't reach your mouse. I just want to, I just want to control, but you can't because, well, you're, uh, it's a remote environment. Well, uh, uh, for that, we've got uh, Visual Studio Live Share. So Visual Studio Live Share is a collaborative um, editing environment that you can do in VS Code or, or like full Visual Studio. So this is not just a like a web developer tool; it's a it's a developer tool. Um, whether you're building .NET applications, doing front end web applications, Java, Node, Python, etc., um, uh, you can use Live Share. Uh, you can even use it within the browser. So if you're using it from VS Code or Visual Studio, um, there's some extensions that you, know, you install, but you can do it entirely from the browser without having to install anything. You literally just need a browser, which means you could run it on something like, you know, like an iPad or possibly even your phone, although that might be a little bit difficult an experience. Um, and what it does is it allows you to, like, you, you share over the, the files and you can access the entire file structure that uh, that person has on the, uh, their machine for that project that they've shared. Um, you get debugging sessions. So if they uh, run a local web server on like localhost 8080, uh, LiveShare will actually forward those requests to your machine. So you can hit localhost 8080 and hit back to their machine. So you can collaboratively debug. You can collaboratively use the terminal so that um, if you want to install a, like another node package that they haven't got installed yet, you can do that. You can npm install if they share their terminal with you, uh, which means that you no longer a, a, a backseat driver watching someone else code and, and trying to get them to follow your instructions over a, like a video call or a voice call. Um, you can now be collaboratively working with them. You can both edit the files at the same time. You can um, follow the other person around. You can go exploring the, uh, the files as well. Um, you can uh, you can also share live share as a read only experience. So it um, if you don't necessarily entrust the person or if you're doing it maybe in like a 
a mob programming um, scenario where you just want to share out to like a heap of different people. You don't want a dozen or so people all trying to work on the same code base at the exact same time. That could get a little bit messy. Um, speaking of terminals, uh, it as I said earlier, um, as a web developer, you'll find yourself needing to use the terminal for uh, definitely for some, a lot of the stuff that we do, whether it's starting a, a web server or um, installing packages with uh, with npm and, and stuff like that. Like there's um, invariably you end up at, at the command line, and what I found is uh, as someone who came from sort of like a Linux, Unix world, but has spent a lot of time in Windows. Like professionally, I've used uh, Windows for my entire career, except for a short period where I did have a Mac and I kind of flirted with that for a while, but I ended up back in Windows. Uh, a lot of tooling is designed around the way uh, like Bash works and, and, and the way that a, like a Unix in Linux environments work. So that's great for people that are on Linux or on Macs, but it's a bit more difficult um, if you're on Windows and doing that translation between you know, like Bash and PowerShell, it gets a little bit ugly. And as someone who, you know, like I said, spent a lot of time initially in, in terminal environments, I, I want to make sure that like, I've got a um, developer experience at the terminal that also matches the like the personality and the customizations that I want when I'm in the browser uh, so when I'm in my text editor um, and that's where Windows terminal really comes into play uh, for a lot of very interesting technical reasons which I will not be going to in this talk uh, Windows has, um, has has always had a very difficult relationship with um, uh, with terminal um, experiences so whether you're working with like cmd.exe or PowerShell like it, there was it was a reason why we couldn't have um, like a tabbed experience. There was a reason why it didn't support Unicode fonts and you know, that kind of stuff. And like I said, there's some very interesting technical reasons to why that's the case. Um, but over the last couple of years, a lot of effort has been done to make the terminal experience that we have working on Windows very much in line with the kind of experience that someone would have if they're working on a Mac or on a Linux machine. Um, this is uh, a screenshot that I, I, I grabbed off one of the uh, PMs on the Windows Terminal uh, team. Um, this, they're running PowerShell, they're running um, Oh My uh, PowerShell to uh, pimp out their terminal um, so that they can provide more contextually aware information. They, uh, they know what folder they're on, what Git branch they're on, um, what uh, they're playing in Spotify. If, like, if that's your jam, you can, um, you can get that kind of information at your terminal. Um, even to the, the point where they've uh, got some customizations on the icons, uh, the, uh, the file and folder icons that are appearing when uh, they uh, do an, an, like an LS here, uh, which I, I, if, it might seem kind of silly, like why do you spend so much time like, focusing on this kind of stuff? But it's, it's those kinds of tweaked experiences that make, at least I find development so much easier because I no longer have something that I feel like I have to use. It's something that I want to use. But still, if uh, as I said, a lot of the tooling that we end up using tends to be um, like uh, Bash first, and not uh, not like PowerShell first or uh, like Windows um, terminal support first. Uh, so that's where WSL comes in, or Windows Subsystem for Linux. Uh, WSL was released, um, I think, about five years ago now, uh, and the first iteration was essentially a translation layer between um, Unix commands or POSIX commands through to the Windows kernel. Uh, it had uh, it was a very useful way to uh, tackle the problem, but it lacked uh, a number of really powerful features that you would want by doing um, like Linux programming, like Linux and Windows programming side by side. WSL2, on the other hand, is a, a full Linux kernel running in a very, very optimized VM on your machine. Uh, so you no longer have this um, like uh, translation lane that's happening. It is like when you do a Linux command, it is running against a Linux kernel inside of a virtualized environment. It will get you kind of 95% of the way there in terms of the things you would do from like a Linux machine. Um, there are definitely edge cases that if you're a hardcore Linux person, um, that WSL2 will still not quite get there. Uh, but I think that they, they should be away at a bunch of that stuff pretty well. Uh, recently, they announced preview support for running GUI applications from Linux on Windows, um, uh, what they're calling WSLG. So that's the graphics support, um, even like sound um, support. So I'm kind of tempted to, to see if I could run like KDE or GNOME inside of it and just like see what happens. Like, can it, I used to use a, a KDE audio player that I really liked back in the day, uh, but it, it, I haven't used it because I've been on Windows for a long time. I wonder if I could run that so I could essentially run an audio player inside of a virtual machine 
and it's running on, uh, which provides no real value to anyone, but it's, you know, I totally can. Um, for me though, I tend to do a lot of my stuff in WSL. Uh, I, that's my primary terminal. Um, I don't use PowerShell all that much. Uh, and I use uh, I use um, ZSH with Oh My ZSH just to customize it to make it feel a little bit more like I want it to feel. Um, I use uh, a terminal multiplexer called Tmux, so I can do splits and um, uh, and uh, uh, like um, collapse sessions and things like that. Uh, and that's kind of how my terminal uh, is like o overly configured. Uh, I probably should learn better how to use uh, Windows terminal, so I don't need a multiplexer quite as um, much as I, I rely on it, but that's how I go about it. Uh, and then, um, but configuring your local environment um, in, and making it the thing that you need it to be uh, is something that I always found tedious um, before joining Microsoft. I was doing consulting work and okay, no doubt the experience that most people have had is that they've gone into a new company and it's like, okay, um, welcome. These are the projects you're gonna be working on. Uh, here's, a, here's a new computer for you to set up. Uh, here is the wiki start on page one and then let us know when you get to the end hopefully your machine will be set up and you're like well what version of node do i need uh, the instructions say that i need node version 8 but that's been obsoleted for a while oh yeah don't worry no just install the latest like well can i update the wiki oh yeah well don't worry we'll get around to that and or like do i need sql server or mongodb redis rabbitmq like what what additional software do i need like if it's a database server that i need running what do i need to configure do i need particular database on there, what user accounts do I need, is there specific passwords that the uh, dev environment is expecting, like how do, how do I get all of those configured? And this uh, invariably ends up being the end of the first week and you're like, yes, I can finally get the source code down onto my machine and hopefully it'll build because I think I've got everything installed. Well, <laughs> with VS Code, um, they, they introduced a series of extensions called remote extensions. One in particular that I like is remote containers. So this is the idea of taking a uh, your, your local environment and putting it inside of a Docker container that you run and you do all of your de development inside of that. So VS Code is actually designed for this uh, from the ground up. It actually runs in a client server model. So you end up with um, your UI process, which is running on your host machine. So it runs on Windows or Mac or whatever. And then we have a container where we install the VS Code server. And, that's where, uh, and then we use a volume mount to bring your source code in. Then the terminal processes you're running, the um, debuggers, uh, additional software, all of that gets installed inside of this container. So do you need node version eight? Sweet, you can put it in the container and not trash the version that you've got on your machine. Are you building an, an application where you wanna talk to a SQL server? Script it up inside of a container so that you've got local development and you've got that pre-configured. Because we can then put this all in part, all down into, our, um, into a Docker file that we then commit as part of our repository. Finally, final thing I wanna talk about before we jump into a demo, it's been a, been a long uh, bit of me talking, <laughs> is hosting. Uh, even compared to what I was originally doing uh, back in like 2005 when I first got started, we have some pretty similar requirements from a web application. We need somewhere to host static assets, HTML files, CSS, images, JavaScript, etc. We need some kind of a backend because the majority of web applications need some kind of a like an API or backend that we're gonna hit. To, to do some processing, otherwise they're purely static and they don't, um, you know, they're, they're just read only and they're, they're not writable applications. And then we're gonna need some way to store that data. So how do we bring all of those to, together? Oh, and maybe bring those together in a way that isn't FTPing them up off your local machine. Um, while there are scenarios where that might be viable, it's probably not the most repeatable and uh, foolproof way to deploy an application into production. Uh, so I want to talk about a service that we released a uh, about two weeks ago, uh, went generally available, or GA, and that is Azure Static Web Apps. So we released this as preview last year, and I've been working on this for about 18 months, and it is hosting for your um, your, your web assets, your HTML, CSS, JavaScript, etc. Uh, but it also gives you a serverless backend using Azure Functions. So they, they, and they come together as one single unit. So if you're building like a single page application or a spa and you just need an API that you wanna write some data through, well, we give you those as one single deployed unit. You don't have to think about, well, how do I manage them separately? Uh, and because it's using the power of Azure functions behind the scenes, we can do all the, like, we can leverage all the bindings that we've got in there. Like you wanna write that data in a CRUD model through to Cosmos DB, 
there's bindings that will very easily just give you a way that you can write those um, uh, documents straight through to Cosmos DB to store them um, and query them back uh, using different endpoints. Um, and what's most important is that the way that you build and deploy this is using, um, uh, it sets up a continuous integration and continuous delivery or CICD pipeline for you uh, using GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps. Uh, we released that uh, about two months ago. Uh, so you, you don't have the choice of just, I just want to copy this file up. No, you can only do it through a repeatable uh, manner using um, uh, CICD. And most importantly, well, for me is that it's free. Uh, I, can, I can set up an application, it doesn't cost me anything um, until I get to kind of a particular point of scale. But I think there's probably enough time of me just here in Slide Deck um, uh, kind of talking about things. Let's jump over and have a bit of a demo of how some of this stuff works. So here we are at my terminal. Um, as I said, this is, uh, this is running WSL2. Uh, and I'm in a web application that I've got. Uh, we can see that I have a bunch of information like the branch that I've got. Um, I've got some uh, pending changes. Um, this is version 01 of it. And I've got node version 15 installed on my machine. I'm going to open up VS Code. Um, I use the VS Code Insiders, but all the stuff that I'm covering off is applicable in uh, just like vanilla VS Code, like stable VS Code. Um, and so this project I've already configured with a dev container. We'll see that I've got a little notification that's popped up here at the bottom. Um, I'll come back to what that uh, that notification in a bit. So we'll just leave you alone. There we go. It'll dismiss itself. Uh, and the reason that it's done that notification is because I have this dev container sitting here, uh, or this dev, dot dev containers folder. And we've got a JSON file and a Docker file. Let's start with the Docker file. And if you're familiar with Docker, it is just a Docker file. Uh, this is using a base image, uh, which uh, installs Azure Functions, and then it also installs Python and .NET Core on there. Uh, it's then going to install uh, NVM, so NVM being a Node Version Manager, so it's going to install that. Um, I then have it, uh, and then have it that will install um, a particular version of um, uh, of Node, and I'm also installing some additional tooling. So I want the Azure Static Web Apps command line tool, and I'm also going to install the uh, GitHub command line tool. So this is now a Docker file. This is in the, the Git repo um, that I'm working with. We then combine that with a JSON file here. And then this JSON file is instructing VS Code how to work with that Docker file. Uh, so I'm, uh, what's the, the, um, the default terminal that I want it to launch? What are extensions that I want to have configured? So I want to have Azure Functions and Static Web Apps, ESLint. Um, this has got a GraphQL backend, so I want to have Apollo GraphQL in there, Prettier, LiveShare, and a bunch of other stuff ready to go. So then, uh, if we go back to our little notification, it's detected that and it says, do you want to reopen this in the container? Sure, because at the moment it's running on my local machine, um, but let's open this up in the container. And now we are running, here we go. There's, the, there's our terminal running. And if I was to do like node version, we'll see that now I'm running node version 14. Whereas my host machine, I actually run node 15. That's my primary version of node. Uh, and uh, because this is then, like it, this is bootstrapping a bunch of stuff in VS Code, uh, we can configure uh, all sorts of things with VS Code uh, inside of the settings. So I can then, um, inside of, where, where do we go? So the dev container, like if I wanted a particular theme to be installed, or if I wanted to enforce editor rules, stuff like that, I can set that up under the settings, which then overrides any settings that the user might have on their version of VS Code, which I think is pretty nifty. Because now we can, like we've defined an environment and we've said, this is how it's gonna work. This is what's available for it. Um, and this is how you get your, your machine up and running and configured the way that you need to, to have it for working on this particular project. Next project might have a different set of tools required. Um, I don't have like a, a database. Um, I'm just using uh, Cosmos DB stored in uh, stored in Azure. But you know, if I was using you know, maybe MongoDB, maybe I'd install Mongo as part of this um, Docker file, uh, and then I just have that fully self-contained environment, and then I could do additional scripting to set up that Mongo instance the way that I need it done. Um, now, what I'm going to do is, uh, before we continue on any further, is start up a live share environment. So I've got live share installed, uh, and I've just accessed that here on the, the sidebar using live share. And we're going to hit share with read only. And I'm going to sign in with my GitHub account. And that's popped over 
to another window. There we go. So what I'm going to do is, for anyone that wants to access it, we will have a live share environment that you can quickly jump onto. So you can have a bit of a play around. Um, like I said, this is uh, this is going to be read only, so you can't come in and uh, make too much uh, of uh, a mess of the, the environment, but you can have a, a play around. So just quickly, uh, let's copy that, and we're going to go uh, QR code. Let's generate a QR code for that. Where is a QR code? No, generator, generator. There we go. Uh, just so that anyone that is... Uh, on the call and watching live. And so, uh, sorry to those people that are not live, uh, watching this as a recording, you are not going to be able to uh, access this uh, live share. So um, if you jump onto that, or if you scan that, um, or you copy that massive long URL very quickly, um, you'll be able to connect into the editor and kind of poke around in my, in my uh, code. What's also useful is that like I say you can do this in the browser. You don't have to install VS Code or Visual Studio on your machine, just straight from the browser. Um, and, but you also will not need to install any of the extensions that I've got. You won't need language packs that are installed um, because uh, that's all running off my machine. I'm giving you access to do all this sort of stuff. In fact, let's just show you how that works and we'll navigate to the live share as well. Uh, let's not open it. I'm just going to open in the browser. So I'll pop this one over to the side. And then we'll have myself side by side. And we'll wait for it to, to start running. It'll get there eventually. Uh, here we go. Ta-da! So now it is starting my VS Code instance, and it's going to start, um, it's going to start syncing with the uh, environment that I've got here. And I will see the uh, files, there we go. I will continue as anonymous and we'll call this Aaron, Aaron's browser. There we go, so now it's joining the collaborative session. Zoom that a touch. And we'll see Eventually, when we deal with you know, the fact that I'm uh, broadcasting live uh, on Australian internet, oh, there we go. Aaron's browser has joined from an anonymous session. We can see the files here. Actually, let's make that bigger and we'll collapse the outline. Uh, we see here's the dev container definition. I could have a look at that Docker file. I could come to say a source file and there is an app.tsx, which is a React application. And I can see, I, this is, I can now navigate all around. Back to say my, my host environment, I can come into live share and I can say, where's Aaron's browser, follow participant. And there they are, pop that to the side. And as I navigate around, um, my, I, I, I can now, I'm now syncing with that person. I can follow them around as they're moving through the, um, through the file and, and we can both see what each other's doing. Um, it's read only, so they can't contribute code to me, but I could, uh, I can change code and they'll see, uh, if I do hello, uh, let's go here and we'll just put a comment and we'll go hello, everyone. Uh, they, that will sync across in a moment to the file, there we go. Uh, and they'll see that change happening um, like within their, their shared version. But let's leave live share alone for the moment and have a look at some of the other things that I talked about. Uh, uh, like I said, the power of this is that we can put as much of this stuff into VS Code as possible, uh, sorry, into source control as possible, so that I don't need to, to think about how to configure things differently uh, at a later point in time. And one of those things that I've configured in here is a debugging environment. Let's go Control P, which brings up um, the command palette, type debug, and then let's go to my rocket, and we're going to launch a debugging environment here. Uh, and that is going to pop a tab elsewhere. Uh, I have everything zoomed in a little bit, so I've got, a, got like things that are really should be a whole lot bigger, um, a whole lot smaller, so my like, screen's getting a little bit crazy. Uh, but let's, okay, so my web server is up and running. Let's bring this one in, because what I've got here is the remote monitored version of, um, uh, of Microsoft Edge which is eventually going to start up. 
Uh, connecting to uh, the server. There we go. Okay. Now we're all up and running. Excellent. I can. Well, I won't, won't worry about zooming in this right hand uh, this right hand window because it's not going to do a whole lot of value. But as you see, I'm, as I'm scrolling over things with inside of the DOM inspector inside of VS Code, it's highlighting the elements in the browser. I can even select and say, I want to see that button. There it is. There's the button in the DOM. Awesome. Um, I, uh, if I click on, uh, say, this one here, I can see the, the class information that's been generated. I don't have source maps working on um, uh, this code base that I'm working with. So unfortunately, we don't get a, a full rich debugging experience um, uh, to like click through the files. Uh, but that's just because uh, for this demo, I was uh, <laughs> just did inline um, source maps on the machine. Uh, sorry, in inline CSS on the machine. Um, I can see the network tab, and this is the sort of stuff that's been happening there. Um, I, but I can also say, let's go to the uh, page. We will go to create game. Where where are we? Uh, element, uh, control P, nope. Okay, let's go to a particular page and we're going to go create game. Um, I'm going to put a breakpoint on this effect here because what's happening is uh, when I click on the button, it's going to start a new game. This is a trivia application. Uh, so it's going to uh, set some state, which is then going to trigger this effect, which will then um, have a cascade through a number of other effects. But it's also going to open up, uh, we're also going to trigger off a call to our backend, which is going to create a new game via GraphQL. So I can put a breakpoint here. So I'm going to hit start game. Uh, let's collapse the debug. Oh, actually, no, we'll leave the debugging information open for a second. Um, we can see a call stack. I can see that I've got breakpoints. Um, if I find the right one, here's, here we go. Here's the call stack in the browser. You see, this is all through a bunch of React. But I am now, I'm breakpointing on a TSX file that is the original file that I wrote. Um, I didn't have to look at the one that's been source mapped and then breakpoint to there. No, I'm, I'm actually just breakpointing on the, the actual file that I was writing. Um, I can step through that. Uh, I've got locals, I've got watch windows, and let's say a watch on creating. Uh, it's set to true, excellent. I can hover over that and I can get um, inspect information. Um, I can you know, look at all the other things that are available in here. Let's hit F5. And then I'm now landed inside of my backend. In our Edge DevTools, we'll see that there's an API call to GraphQL. That's, where, that's what's happening right now, which is inside of here. Uh, the DevTools is saying this is pending. It's a pending fetch um, to the GraphQL endpoint. It's because I've got a breakpoint sitting on here uh, that I can have a look again. Rich debugging experience. Um, this is now uh, this particular file here. It's inside of this node worker. Um, I could then step backwards through the node modules that have triggered all of this off. So this is through the Apollo GraphQL pipeline. Um, but this is the, it's the same debugging experience that I had for the front end inside of the same editor, like inside of this one combined application. I have this like single experience. I'm not jumping between a bunch of different tools. Let's just hit F5 and we'll run that through. We'll end up at another breakpoint over here, which if I drop to the right debugger, <laughs> I've got so many debuggers attached. I've actually got five debuggers running at this point in time, I think. Um, and we can have a look at information here. Excellent, let's run that. Uh, now it's, yep, we've successfully called. Uh, it's, it's no longer loading that response, which we'll see. Our GraphQL response has returned to 200. Uh, we did call that. Um, there wasn't an error. We got some data. We can unpack that create game. We get that ID, and this will then navigate through to the next file, uh, next page of our application. We'll see there, which is all really cool. Um, another thing we can do with these, uh, this tooling here is that I can, um, I can actually view the page uh, inside of VS Code. So this is, so this is the page. I can like, um, it's not. There we go. There we go. I clicked into there. Uh, so we can do Aaron. So Aaron can join the game. Uh, so I can have that side by side with the network with the DOM Explorer. Um, I have blown something up in my back end. I should have gone a bit further through in my testing when I was doing this earlier, but fantastic. We can we can produce errors. And isn't that, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do? Um, now, if we wanted to deploy this, uh, let me just kill off all of my debuggers because I don't need them running at the minute. 
and uh, so I can do um, so I've installed the GitHub command line tooling, gh, and do gh repo. Oops. Yep, we out of that. Gh repo create. Ah, oh, oh, I'm not logged in on this one. Well, that's annoying. Uh, gh auth login. Uh, we'll log into github.com. There we go. Yep, log in with browser. And, whoops, let's hope no one else can log in on my behalf. Uh, do, 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 hit enter when that's copied. Boom. Uh, again, I forgot to get the last bit of my demo up and running beforehand. Uh, 80, there we go. Log that in. Authorize GitHub. Done. Okay, so we are done, we're authenticated, and now I can do gh repo create, uh, we'll call it that, uh, don't worry about a description, we'll make it public, we'll create that as the origin, give that a moment, there we go, we have set up that, and then I can come in and go to my Azure Static Web Apps, and let's create a new Static Web Apps. Uh, we're going to commit all the current outstanding changes and let's create a, this to be deployed. The app will be there, output it build and let's, oh, hopefully it will have set up the API correctly. Um, but what this is doing behind the scenes is it's setting up some resources in Azure. It's then also creating me a CICD pipeline, which will appear in the, uh, the it will appear in a .github folder um, that, at least I think it'll do it locally. If not, it does it straight on GitHub. There we go. Uh, git pull. Uh, git, oops, git push uh, origin main dash u, because I forgot to do that before. Uh, so it will have uh, git pull origin main. It didn't set up my remotes properly. There we go. Uh, that should have worked. If not, we'll just come into here in the browser, find my right browser. Uh, realize that I didn't do <laughs> that; it didn't push things properly beforehand. So, um, with that, I'm going to uh, wrap up the demo and uh, call that a, a little bit of an error. Um, and I'm just going to very quickly jump through to the last um, few slides. So, uh, here's a bunch of links of the stuff that I talked about today. Uh, I've also put QR codes if you want to quickly scan anything as it goes through or um, get them off the video later on. So the Microsoft Edge tools for VS Code, that gave us the ability to um, inspect the DOM, manipulate styles, check out the network tab, you know that kind of stuff inside of VS Code as an editor. Uh, we didn't have the debugger for uh, Microsoft Edge. Uh, this allowed us to attach VS Code's JavaScript debugger to Microsoft Edge uh, and debug the, the running JavaScript of the uh, that's running client side inside of um, VS Code. Um, as I said there's equivalent ones for Chrome and Firefox, um, and I think Safari uh, in this regards. Uh, Visual Studio Live Share, uh, so that we can set up a remote environment that anyone can connect into. Um, we can do pair programming, or we can set out like a read-only version if you're doing like a webcast like this, uh, so that people can have a poke around in your source code as well. Um, that works for VS Code, Visual Studio, and uh, you can run it entirely in the browser. Uh, Windows Terminal, uh, just a, a much better terminal experience than you get out of just default PowerShell, or default command, or um, uh, default WSL on, uh, on Windows. And of course, WSL2, if you want to do uh, Linux um, stuff, um, this will uh, give you instructions on how to get that set up um, so that you can install whichever distro it is that you prefer. Um, I, I do Ubuntu because I come from like, like Debian um, is the sort of approach I want. But if you want Red Hat or there's a bunch of other distros that you can have uh, that you can use and you can even run multiple distros side by side. Um, I used uh, remote containers to set up that isolated dev container environment so that I could install everything that I needed in there without having to um, uh, worry about what uh, what was installed locally versus what I actually needed for the project. I needed Node 14, but I had Node 15 on my host machine. Dev container took care of that. 
Um, I, and then finally, uh, I was hoping to deploy to Azure Static Web Apps, but uh, because I hadn't created the GitHub repo beforehand, uh, I stuffed up the initial push, which then caused uh, a bunch of cascading failures, which is unfortunate. But you can check out more about Static Web Apps, how you could run like a React or Vue or Angular or anything like that um, on Static Web Apps. Well, that's been a lot of stuff in a fairly short period of time, um, at least for me, it feels like it's been a very short period of time. Um, I'm gonna jump back over to the chat and uh, have a look. I'd seen some questions had popped through. Uh, but uh, if you do uh, wanna ask me any questions or reach out after the session as well, uh, that's where you can find me on, uh, on Twitter. Um, I have a bunch of this stuff covered off in my blog or uh, email if you wanna uh, reach out to me in that regards. Uh, but uh, so one of the first questions uh, that I saw come in uh, was, uh, the best way to what are the best way to save settings um so i'm going to assume that means in regards to vs code um uh, please uh, chime in again if uh if that's not the context that you're asking uh, for settings but uh with vs code um there is built-in um setting sync so i have that uh set up um and you can choose if you want to sync that with your github account or a microsoft account um another good thing to do is uh is to actually commit settings as part of a git repo uh, so inside of the VS Code folder, um, you can set a uh, you can create a settings.json file, and we can configure um, stuff inside of there. So uh, these are the settings that Static Web Apps has contributed for me. Um, so the uh, where's the where's the application live, the API build, etc. Um, but you could also put in settings here for like, the way that you want the editor laid out. Like are you using tabs versus spaces. What's the indent depth that you want? Uh, you can configure that inside of this settings file, and then that's specific for that repository. Um, so that's a useful thing to have if you want to um, have people's environment set up as best as you can without them having to come back in the future and kind of tweak it for what they need or or, or for standards that you haven't got as well documented as uh, as maybe someone would like. Uh, so the, the next question is, um, what's the best browser to, uh, to test applications on? Um, my answer to that is whatever browser that you uh, prefer using. Um, I use uh, Microsoft Edge predominantly as a browser and not just because I work for Microsoft. Um, I've been using Microsoft Edge as my primary browser for a very long time. I was actually an Internet Explorer MVP before I joined Microsoft. So I've had a long uh, relationship with uh, Microsoft web browsers. Uh, but all browsers these days are pretty much the same. Unless you're trying to get really specific bleeding edge standards, um, like, whether you're using Edge or Chrome or Firefox, Safari, etc., it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Uh, and pretty much every browser these days, with the exception of Safari, uh, is cross-platform. So whether you're on Windows or Mac or Linux, you can install Chrome, Firefox, Edge, um, and they'll just work. Um, you know, the the things that that change the way that I choose a browser to test on is what kind of extensions they have available for the sorts of things that I'm doing. Like if I'm doing a React application, can I use the React developer tools? If not, then, well, I'm probably going to go with a different browser. Uh, but I think that just about does us uh, for the day. Um, if you've got any, uh, if anyone's got any other questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me on social media. Uh, but thanks for thanks for joining us today. Um, I hope that's been insightful. I hope you've learned about a few new things to add to uh, your web developer toolbox. Bye. Thank you very much, Aaron, and thank you to everyone for tuning in today. We've just added into the comment section there the link to the survey, Sydney's upcoming events uh, with the Reactor and also the global ones and the YouTube channel. So just a reminder, again, this one will be uploaded to the YouTube channel um, straight after this session and also a link to the um, PowerPoints there. Uh, and if you haven't checked in for today, please do. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in and thanks again to Aaron. Have a good rest of your afternoon, evening or morning wherever you joined us from and we'll see you next time for another Microsoft Livestream event. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs>